Brilliant, great. Thanks, everybody. Um, so a little bit, uh, a little bit about me. Um, uh, don't worry, <laughs> don't worry. I don't have a photograph of myself on every slide here as well. Um, but as I said, my name is James Bokit. Um, I look after uh, delivery uh, for a small consultancy in uh, the UK called Open Credo. We're a hands-on software development software development consultancy, and uh, we help clients deliver more effectively across a variety of different areas. So, but the main theme to our delivery is always kind of data platform engineering. Um, I started my I started my career, or I spent a large portion of my career, as working with kind of data centric applications. Uh, so I, I often joke that basically my career has been spent kind of shoveling data from one side of the server room to the other side of the server room. But lately it's been kind of via cloud and microservices and big data and, and the more exotic kind of, uh, the more exotic forms of databases, you know, graph databases, time series, this kind of thing. Now the thing is, over the course of doing a lot of data over my, over my time uh, as an engineer, I've kind of found that actually, if you do a lot of ETL work, actually there's been times in my career I look back and there's things that I could have done differently. And I think, well, how could I have done those differently? And I think that lineage is part and parcel or recording the lineage is part and parcel of if I had that kind of tool in my toolbox, then I could have really, really helped stakeholders a lot better. So I've kind of had this itch around data lineage for a good few years in my career. So um, I kind of decided to kind of bite the bullet and do a, a, a conference talk on it. And I've, I've got a prototype that I wanted to show you. Uh, so we'll get into that now. Um, so, you know, how does that relate to the problems that we have with data today? So there's this really interesting statistic that's often quoted, and uh, I think it became, I think it came from IBM, um, but Forbes point to IBM and IBM point to Forbes, which is a data lineage problem in and of itself. But there's this estimate that there's two and a half quintillion bytes of data being produced every day in the world. Now, I, 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 didn't, I don't really understand what that number means, so I kind of looked at, at how that might, what that number might actually, uh, might, might actually map onto. Now, 10 quintillion, is the estimate for the amount of insects that are on planet Earth right now. So um, I apologize, I apologize for this metaphor or for this simile rather. Um, but that is so every four or five days we're producing more bytes of data than there are insects on the planet. So that's you know that's a lot of data, right? Um, and we're using data in lots of different ways as well. We use it in decision making, we maybe have real time, we have batch, we have historic records keeping. We've got data everywhere and we're using it in lots of different ways. So data is dis disparate. It's in lots of different places. It might be in a silo, might be on-prem, might be in the cloud, uh, might be on the blockchain. Um, um, so it's disparate and it's distributed, but it is also connected together. You know, data is used to derive other things of data, other pieces of data. And so this is something that is very intrinsic to something like data mesh as well. Now we'll come back to the, the, uh, the, the last point on there where um, we're actually going to have to make decisions or when we make decisions using data that actually we're going to have to be able to explain those. We'll come back to that when we start to talk a little bit about ML ops. Um, but lots of good talks start with a definition. So this is this is a definition that I got off, uh, got off Wikipedia, which is the, the font of all knowledge and the center of the center of the internet universe as we know. Um, so data lineage, basically, what I want for any given piece of data in my world, I want to know about its parents and its ancestors. Generally, all the way back to something that most likely happened in the real world. Someone did a trade, someone went into a shop and bought something, someone clicked on a link in a web page. This is, this is what I care about. I want to know how is, that, how is that related to the piece of data that I'm looking at right now? And so can I rely upon it? And if I can't rely upon it, why can't I rely on it? And if I fix it, how does that affect this piece of data that I'm looking at right now? So if I look at what we can look at now is, is some practical use cases that data lineage actually solves. Because if data is big and data is disparate, but it's connected and also derived from other pieces of data, 
then you're going to need some automation to be able to um, manage that lineage and help make sense of it all. Otherwise, you're just basically collecting data and you don't know quite where it's come from and whether you can rely upon it or not. So I have some examples from my, uh, from my career. So this is, a, this is something I worked on a few years ago. So this was part of a, a MIFID II system, uh, which if you've ever worked in finance, so uh, about sort of five, six years ago, MIFID II was what, what anyone was doing in finance. So this particular bank had uh, five different client feeds. And uh, what we needed to do was we would need to aggregate those together to create a client's table. I mean, so far, so boring, right? Now, the problem with this is that the client feeds, they some of the data in those client feeds would overlap. So James Bokett, as a client, might be in client's feed one and three. Now, the interesting thing is as well is that my address might be correct in client feed number one, but actually client feed number three had my tax status. Uh, and client feed number two might have my tax status, but it's actually more accurate than the client feed number three. So the manner in which the feeds were uh, combined together, were aggregated together, the fields would overlap. So it wasn't just a straightforward thing of saying, client fees one through to five, that comes through into um, the aggregated clients table, that's its lineage. Actually, for any given record, it might have come from all different sources and might have been combined together in all different, all different uh, exotic ways. So you would only know this from looking at the code at that point in time, not from the resultant data. And so actually, if you want to then kind of look back at something, if you say the, the end record is wrong, this, this record for James Bokeh is incorrect, it's actually very, very difficult to understand where that data came from, which of those sources do I need to go and fix to send it through. So that's one use case. Um, Another use case, um, I used to work in uh, fraud detection and money laundering detection. And one of the things we used to look at was, uh, one of the things we used to detect was customers perpetrate a fraud. So uh, 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 a customer is actually acting differently to its peer group. So this was for retail banks. So we would detect, uh, as I said, money laundering or we detect uh, check fraud or, or um, custom, uh, credit card fraud. So what we do is we uh, take the, uh, the account level information and we compare that with a peer group. So how we did that was uh, we'd have a bunch of transactions, you know, uh, your retail banking transactions, whatever it might be, and we would create a bunch of data cubes. So we would then group by accounts and we group by account and then month and then we group by account and year. Now the problem with that is if one of those transactions turns out to be bogus, it then poisons six different tables. Now that's a real problem because actually you're going to make, uh, <laughs> ultimately you're going to make decisions of whether uh, uh, the police are gonna go knocking on somebody's door. So you kind of gotta get this right. So being able to, if, if I had been able to say, well, this transaction is incorrect and it needs to be restated, these are all of the people, these are all of the, the affected parts of the data, then I could have done incremental changes. Because sadly, what we used to do in this system is that we would deal with it. We would just let it ride and hope that it wasn't the bad, we hope that it wasn't the worst transaction, it wasn't the, the most fraudulent transaction that actually turned out to be um, corrupted. So we just lived it, lived with it. So one transaction had the, or one entry in a data file had the opportunity to actually poison six downstream tables, regardless of the actual underlying transaction table as well. So you see this, this is where a, a source system problem then starts to ripple out throughout your data estate, whatever that might look like. So my requirements for the prototype that I wanted to put together, I had some core use cases and I had some design constraints. Core use cases was that lineage could change over time. It wasn't that sources A and B then go to source C, is actually I wanted it on a per document or uh, per record basis. I want to be able to restate incremental changes, things that change over time or things that are poisoned over time, I want to then be able to 
um, restate those and resend those and re-amalgamate them together in my, in my upstream processes. I want to be able to track those changes in data over time. And uh, we live in a world of continuous delivery. Uh, uh, Open Credo, everything that we do is pretty much uh, continuously delivered. Um, so we want to be able to do blue-green in production. And for data-centric applications, that's notoriously difficult. If you've ever worked on a big risk system in a bank, that is not, uh, that's not something that people like to do. Uh, they say, well, you know, you can take a dump of data and you can take a dump of production and then you can run it in, in test for three months and then you can do your release a little bit, uh, a little bit after that. Um, and I want to be able to track that, track that data all the way through the system. What's the impact of it? What, why, if this data is poisoned, what is, what is, what has it poisoned downstream of it? Um, and finally, I think when we when we talk about security of data, you know, if we're going to start democratizing our data in a data mesh or something like that, and I'm going to have my data flying all around my enterprise, I need to be able to make sure that the the data principles and the security principles that I put in place right at the bottom at the start are taken all the way through wherever that data ends up. Um, in terms of the design constraints, I've got them there, but I didn't want it to be too invasive into the application. And uh, the application just says, hey, I'm publishing this piece of data out. This is where it came from. And that's all the application needs to do. But what about existing tools? Surely there are existing tools out there. Now, there are existing tools out there, and they, there's, there's a lot of them that are great. And, and I know there was another uh, graph-based data lineage talk this morning, which I, I had a, a meeting class, so I wasn't able to go to. So I am really interested in those folks as well. Um, but the problem with a lot of those cataloging tools that I find is that they're great at keeping your data structures in sync with the catalog. That's great, that's a fighting start. You're already off on a head start there. But the problem is it doesn't really offer you much in terms of branching or labels or version control. Um, it just, it's a very static. This is what your database looks like in production. This is your catalog. It doesn't tell you anything about the content of those rows or where they have may have come from and being able to kind of trace on, a, on an individual uh, resulting row document um, or a data perspective. So, and that's just not ideal in the world of continuous delivery and multi-feature development and things, because we need to do that. Um, I'll just take you on a very brief date, uh, detour. Um, all databases, graph databases, everything works with a commit log. It's a sequenced immutable log of changes that happen to the data. If you've ever seen me give a conference talk before, does that remind you of anything? Um, should remind you with a, uh, of a well-known streaming platform that begins with a K and rhymes with Schmafka. Um, so, uh, so a database will have lots of changes happening to it, regardless of the database kind that it is, whether it's a, you know, a, a SQL store, no SQL store, uh, no uh, Neo4j or whatever. Um, that will then turn that into a, a log of the changes. And then we can use Debezium which I believe there was a uh, version two that came out very soon. It's either coming out soon or it's, it's just come out actually, which will listen into that change data capture log and will send it along on Kafka, which we can then do stuff with without having to know anything. So the source application that's entering data into that database doesn't need to know anything about the, the people that are um, consuming the events from that. Um, change data capture really interestingly when I've kind of given this talk before uh, people kind of begrudgingly put their hand up when I ask kind of uh, hey who um, who uses this thing um, lots and lots of people use it and uh, they find it a little bit brittle in places uh, but it's it's it, it does have it does have its use in the in, in the landscape I think these days um, the example application that I put together is a bit of a trade simulator so I then have uh, some uh, some trades get done, and then we create some summaries, and then all the way through, we're going to listen in on those in Debezium. They get shoved down onto Kafka, and then we have a little piece of software that I've written, a little Spring Boot app, which uh, listens in, called the CDDC Listener, and then it will then publish that out into our data lineage catalog, and it publishes it both to Neo uh, and to Postgres as well, because I had a Postgres database knocking about. And one of the things that I'll show you as well is that you can do graph-ish style queries using Postgres, but you are much better off, way, way better off doing that in Neo4j because that's what it's built for, um, unsurprisingly being a graph database. space. Um, this is a little piece of Java which shows you the record descriptor. So this is the descriptor that the applications will need to publish out. Um, 
Now this gets turned into uh, a piece of JSON. And what happens is that if you insert this piece of JSON in with a piece of SQL or, 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 or something happening in the source system, this will then work its way into the uh, payload from Debezium and then our CDC listener can listen to this, turn it into the graph of nodes because as you can see that it's a, it's a recursive data structure. It's a, you know, you've got a, a child table names, you've got parent table names in there and it will then turn that into the, into the graph. So I realize I only have about 20 minutes left. So um, we'll go on to the demo or as my notes say here, uh, career suicide. So I have here, so I have here, so I have, um, I have uh, Debezium running, Kafka with Zookeeper, I've got Postgres and I've got Neo running there. So that is in this window here. So I've already run those Docker containers up. Uh, it uses um, uh, Flyway uh, for uh, uh, updating the database, creating the database and everything. Um, so where am I here? So I have a little script here, which sets up the connectors, which just calls the uh, Debezium world to actually just sort of uh, start up the connectors, which will start listening into the source database, which the host application is running in, um, uh, is running in Postgres. So we have here, so I will just, oh yeah, that's the right. It's the right screen. So, um, so if I give you a little bit of a tour of the CDC listener, let me find it here. So the CDC listener, it consumes from the CDC uh, events. So it's, it's a Spring Boot app. So it all all the magic happens using um, uh, using annotations. So this is the uh, events coming from the different tables within the the, the application. And this is uh, what we're listening to on uh, uh, within Debezium. And then this thing persists it and it shoves it into uh, the Neo persistence, which turns one of those records into one of these. And so, so it turns um, one of these into uh, a Neo descriptor um, uh, instance, which can then be uh, submitted in, down into Neo and persisted, yeah. Um, so the other thing to show you is, um, so if we start the, the CDC listener, so that will start up, hopefully, um, and it's actually found a bunch of records already to save because the commit log within Postgres already, already has records committed into it, so therefore it already has some changes which Debezium is able to already pick up as well. So these were entries into the uh, participant table because it seeds the, the, seeds the data start with. So that's sitting there, that's waiting for some changes to happen to that Postgres database, and then it will submit them into our, uh, into our Neo4j instance, which I don't have open, hang on. Oops, oops. So that's that. Uh, so I can peel that off. Bring that in here. So I show you this. So I see this is this is all that's in my. So I'm just selecting all of the nodes in my in my graph and. Uh, bear in mind that this is not the actual data, this is the lineage record. So therefore this participant, it has, this is a, this is a thing in the real world. It's a record of somebody in the real world. This is not uh, something that's actually um, got any lineage associated with it yet. So then what I can run here is my order creation thing, which is something that will just basically start pumping into my Postgres database, into my application database, some new orders. So you can see there, order created, order created. And what we'll be able to see here is we're doing some saving as well. So if I then rerun this bad boy, then I can see, look, I've got some orders in here. Lovely, lovely, lovely. But it, what you can see is actually, these are not connected. These are just, I've got a participant here. You might not be able to see that. So I've got a participant here and I've got an order here. 
and there's nothing there's nothing connected to them because they're not because they're in two different tables so if you think back to my um, prototype application what i was talking about was that actually i have these summary records or these summary these summary processes so i actually have piece of SQL here. So this is, so I'll run the participant summary so that doesn't take too long, but this is actually just a, an aggregation piece of SQL here. Now, SQL has actually become a little bit cooler in the last few years. I know it might be difficult to, to believe at a Neo conference, but um, there are, you, you can actually do some really interesting kind of JSON aggregations within Postgres. So actually what this does, this piece of SQL here, is that it creates one of those lineage catalog descriptors within the SQL query itself so that basically there's no other kind of application logic for it. It's just created that and said, here's a new piece of, uh, here's a new piece of data, here's its lineage, and then that comes down the, um, uh, that comes down our uh, um, uh, change data capture pipe. So if we look at the whole graph now, we can actually see that these things are linked together. So I can see that this participant has done these orders. So actually I know now, so this is, again, this is not the actual data. This is just the lineage of that data. I just know that these records are related to each other. So this participant is a parent of this order, um, but I don't have any kind of concept of what is in that order or anything like that, because that is stored in a different database that's stored in Postgres. Now, if I run one of our, Oh, but actually, I'm going to kill this one. It's the order creation because we don't need any more orders because um, I'm now going to run the participant type summary, which is the next aggregation in our pyramid. And so that should give us, is that finished? Yes, that's finished. So this, that will give us, that should give us some more, even more um, lineage. So if we look here, yes. So here, then we have an order uh, has a parent of the uh, participant and then the participant summary, that should be. I can't see if I can show you that anyway. That's a participant summary record. Um, so all of these records go into this participant summary along with the participant itself. And then this is then uh, aggregated together to create a participant type summary. And so we can see, it's really interesting actually, when I was writing this, that uh, when I was writing this little application, is that you could actually tell when I'd made, I could tell when I'd made a mistake because actually viewing the data like this, I could see, well, actually I've got this guy here and he doesn't have the same shape as these ones here. So you're actually able to tell what's going on in your application just by inspecting the metadata around some of your records. And you know, as a as a bike as a as a sidebar, the reason this doesn't have a participant type summary is probably because it doesn't have enough uh, orders uh, related to it yet. Uh, so I've got some about. Uh, I need to hurry. <laughs> so uh, so that's so. If we look at so, let me show you this then. So if we look at this, this is a. So let's look at some of the um, individual records here. And I can show you, I've got I'll take the name, participant. Uh, I'm not sure which way around this is. Let's have a look at this. So let's look at this. So if I take this and we take a uh, participant type summary. So this now shows you. So if I go, if I go back to that piece of uh, piece of cipher there. So this is using APOC here. So um, I don't know if everybody uses this, but uh, APOC is um, uh, awesome procedures on cipher. Uh, also a, a really nice. I don't know if this is a backronym or not, um, but uh, APOC was also killed by cipher in the original Matrix film as well. So um, on the Nebuchadnezzar. So. Um, but what this says here is, I want to get all the parents of a type summary, i.e., what are all the all of the records 
that have been uh, that have given rise to this participant type summary. So, i.e., what is its lineage? So, this actually tells me this is the universe of records that have gone into this particular uh, have gone into this particular um, uh, in, into this particular record. So, if I can also then show you uh, participant type summary. So this is also stored in the Postgres database as well. Oops, and I just do this. Oops. Oops, that's it. Uh, so this is this is another example of, of kind of a cool piece of SQL as well, is that actually it's got a recursive call here, which is how you get that. So this is a self-join, uh, which carries on self-joining back to the table until it finds um, uh, records that don't have, uh, don't, uh, which don't have any parents. Okay, so this is woefully uh, inefficient if you compare it to the way in which uh, Neo does it. But it's to say that actually you can do this in SQL, but you really shouldn't. You should probably use a, a graph database instead. Um, but it's interesting to compare and contrast the uh, ways in which the two pieces of uh, kind of uh, data retrieval technology do it. So going back to the whole of our graph again, if I find a, uh, what am I going to need to do? Uh, so we need to find uh, all of the records within a, uh, that's, so maybe we've loaded one of these orders and they're bad. So if we take this one, and we take this row ID here. Uh, so this is coming back to so this says I want to find this order that was poisoned. Now tell me where that order has ended up. And so that then gives me all of the records that are then basically tainted by that bad order. Yeah, all through querying that catalog within uh, within Neo. And this does really nice things where if you, you, you use APOC to, to match the, the child record and then you walk backwards through the graph, which is one of the great things that, that APOC gives you. So if I can, I can then put that into here and I can do the same thing as well. Well, um, but this you see how the graph is a, is a much more natural data structure for this rather than a table of uh, a table of results as well because I'm going to have to then write some code that iterates over this and, and, and so on in a way that understands that null is um, is a is a is a, is, a is, is, is the is the bottom of the bottom of the, the lineage. Um, Right, I will need to speed up now. Um, so that's that's the that's our demo. Um, so as I was writing this, I was writing this prototype. Um, it actually occurred to me actually there's there's other features that I might be able to do with this now. Um, and I've got a couple of examples here. So uh, hang on. Oops, sorry, I am not looking. I'm not showing the slides properly. Uh, Ah, there we are. There. Um, so, what are the other features that the data lineage enables then? So, uh, cell based security is one of them. So, uh, DBMSs can restrict data from certain columns, but they can't do rows because that is a business level concern. You, you, you know, as the author of that data, what a, a row or a document or a node in the graph actually. Uh, pertains to, and what is the security level that should be associated with that? Um, uh, right, I'm just checking on my, I need to check on my time. Uh, 10, oh, right, okay, five minutes. Thank you, Alexander. <laughs> um, so in terms of how to do that, you, oh, great. Thank you, right. Uh, in terms of how to do that, you'll have some kind of principle there, you have a data service, you've got some security rules, maybe you've got OPA uh, doing that, you've got some source data, you've got your lineage catalog. So you um, 
you receive the request, then you go and get that data, consult the catalog, then for this piece of data is, and for its lineage, is the principle allowed through all of the layers, all of the ancestors of this piece of data? Um, and if it is, then that's good, we can return it. If not, then we might want to throw an error or something like this. Now, you can cache that data because it's immutable, so, you can, so you'll be fine with that. Um, but you might want to consider maybe some naming conventions in the row ideas to show the ultimate lineage, something like this, that will make that a little bit more algorithmic on retrieval rather than having to go you know, uh, and consult two databases on a per row basis. But um, it's entirely up to your individual use case. I did promise um, talking a little bit about MLOps as well. So MLOps, basically everything needs to be code. You've got your code, your training set, and your resulting parameters, that's all code. You need to be able to track that. You need to be able to say, right, any prejudices or biases are a result of this particular training set. And not just the training set, but also where did that training set come from as well? It's not that we've coded this thing to have biases and to uh, be um, you know, inherently uh, prejudice against a particular group of people is because we gave it the wrong set. Change the set and this is why it's better. Because this will enable you to have reproducibility and explainability on your code base. Um, you don't necessarily have to have all of your resulting params because some of the uh, params are, the, the weights are, you know, millions if not billions of data points in there. But you might want to have a manifest entry that uh, is able to just basically encapsulate that. You make your data, um, you store that in cold storage, S3, something like that. And then you have a manifest entry that says this is this data here, and that becomes a much more workable solution. Um, I won't go through blue-green because it doesn't, you don't need lineage for blue-green, but it does definitely help. Um, I will go through that and I will finish up. So my key takeaways are knowing where your data comes from is really important. Um, the current tooling doesn't cope very well with the history. You know, where data comes from, in my experience, is not static. It changes with the code. It can change uh, just in the lifetime of the data coming through. Um, and you, if, once you start to track the lineage, there are some really interesting and helpful use cases. You can do incremental and historic deltas of your loading uh, applications, and you can track tainted rows from an input source or a version. Um, and you can track that data as to how it related to a decision, something that you then did, so that you can then explain that. And as data gets bigger, that's going to get more important, and it's going to get harder if you don't have something in place. You can do cell-based security, and you can do blue-green deployments as well. So um, sorry for rushing the last piece there. I wanted to kind of really spend some time on the, uh, on the demo. The code for the demo is all available on uh, GitHub, um, the, the QR code there takes you to the GitHub as well, So, um, but I believe the slides will be available. And that's, that's all, folks. I've got a minute to spare, I think. Oops. One time is enough. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, James. Uh, very interesting, very, very uh, a great uh, presentation. So um, again, asking everybody in in chat to uh, use this the, these emojis uh, to virtually clap for James. So uh, gets uh, at least, uh, if not audible, but at least a visible applause. Um, so uh, very cool. Um, the um, if you have any questions, also that's uh, we have a couple of of min uh, well one one minute sixty seconds or so uh, left. So, if um, if anybody uh, has any questions, uh, that would be the time now. Um, um, yeah, the demo here. Question on the demo. So the demo, the code, everything. I mean, the video obviously so will be available afterwards. We can rewatch it. the uh, The code is on GitHub. So uh, what, what what James just shared. Um, so that's that's all available. So you can uh, re rework through uh, uh, the example that uh, that was just presented um, for everybody. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Please, please do. And if you've got any feedback or, or anything, um, 
uh, please just um, you know, please you know, can reach me on LinkedIn or Twitter or any of those any of those things. Um, I'd love to hear it. I'd love to hear if you're using it. I would really, I really love people to use it. Um, um, I did speak to some people about this before, and they said, "Oh, you know, what are you selling?" I was like, "No, actually, I'm not selling. I'm just like people to use this code, really." So, um, um, so yeah, I, I'd love to see if it's if it's if it's actually helpful in, and you're using it, really. Yeah, that's very nice and uh, yeah, super super cool. Um, yeah, uh, thank you very much, James. I don't see any any other questions for now. Uh, I guess it may come uh, later on. So uh, thank you, James. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for uh, the demo and the present presentation. And um, see you uh, another time, I guess. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for sticking with it. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs>